December 20th, 1994. It was production, production, production. Safety, safety was a word. Yeah, it wasn't really practiced. For decades, it produced nuclear weapons to protect the United States. This is where we manufactured the plutonium pits for nuclear warheads. But with the Cold War over, it has become the enemy. I've seen people with gross amounts of contamination. I've been grossly contaminated. I've had plutonium nitrate leak out from over my head and run down my forehead. And the liquid squoze up out of the tail of the cut, and it ran down my arm and down my leg, and... I spent seven hours having my body deconned and then... In an unusually blunt language for someone who works at Rocky Flats, he said, literally, these are ticking time bombs. Tonight, the most dangerous building in America, seen from the inside. <laughs> This is ABC News Nightline. Substituting for Ted Koppel and reporting from Washington, Cokie Roberts. The case of Karen Silkwood, one young woman contaminated by plutonium, shocked the country when a movie was made about her life. But what's happening now in nuclear weapons plants around the country is more shocking still. Tons of radioactive waste threaten to contaminate not just workers in their plants, but the surrounding environment as well. Today, the Department of Energy released a plan to clean up plutonium left over from nuclear weapons productions at 13 sites. The most egregious examples of poisonous buildings are at Rocky Flats, Colorado. The situation there is so bad that the Department of Energy has decided there's nothing left to do but tell the truth, say publicly that what happened at Rocky Flats was a terrible mistake. Officials there allowed nightline cameras inside the plant and agreed to let us see and hear just how bad it is. Dave Marish has a special three-part report. Rocky Flats nuclear weapons plant is where America made the triggers for its hydrogen bombs. Small atomic bombs, these were, their key ingredient, plutonium. Today, 41 years and 50,000 nuclear triggers later, the Department of Energy has confessed Rocky Flats is awash in the leftovers. 14.2 tons of plutonium, one of the world's most toxic substances. We know, for example, that it's in the vents, and it's in the ductwork. We know it's in the glove boxes and the lays. We know it's in the walls. We know it's in the floors and the ceiling. We just can't tell you exactly how much it is in any given location in a lot of places. An internal Rocky Flats memo says as much as 1,320 pounds of plutonium may be hidden in ducts, pipes, vents, and glove boxes at the plant. This fiber optic journey down one ventilation duct, past its stalactites and stalagmites of plutonium, helped convince the energy department it had a problem at Rocky Flats. Only a minute fraction of more than 400 miles of pipes and ducts have gotten this treatment. And not only have all the pipes not been surveyed, some of them haven't been found yet. Most of the sites had very poor record keeping. And in fact, in these and other buildings, we do not have as-built drawings. So a building was built and then was added onto, and we literally don't know where every pipe is, where every line is. Mark Silverman is half of the top management team at Rocky Flats, the federal half. Anson Burlingame leads the private side for EG&G, the energy department's contracted manager at the plant. Both men led Nightline on a rare television tour of some of Rocky Flats' most dangerous places, including Building 776, where drums of plutonium waste overflow hallways and spare rooms. They're going to punch a hole in the drum. Any gas in that drum will go through that braided line into these sample bottles. Like a lot of the more than 5,000 sealed containers of waste at Rocky Flats, this one is suspected of containing a buildup of hydrogen gas, which can rupture a container, scattering <laughs> lethal plutonium. He just punched the drum. The samples will be taken to an analytical laboratory to tell us specifically what were the gases, if any, in these drums. Like an endless game of Russian roulette, these blind tests of packages whose plutonium content cannot be known in advance are everyday business at Rocky Flats. The reason there is so much plutonium at Rocky Flats, sitting in so many dangerously inadequate containers, 
is that when the previous private contractor at the plant, Rockwell International, was first ordered to stop nuclear weapons production and then fired in 1989, they left everything just so. The 14.2 tons of plutonium, the 30,000 liters of nitric acid containing plutonium, was constantly being moved and processed throughout the plant to execute the site's Cold War mission to build nuclear weapons components. At the time of the shutdown, basically it coasted to a halt in the middle of a production cycle. And that's one of the greatest risks right now, is that these cans that are stored for five years were not packaged to be stored any longer than a year at the most before they would be recycled back into the stream. And I've seen it catch on fire. I don't know what's keeping it from burning right now. Most effective, says Ray Geyer, who's worked there for 32 years, is building 771, once Rocky Flats Plutonium Processing Center, and now, says the Energy Department, perhaps the most dangerous building in America. It scares the hell out of me, because I had to clean up after a lot of fires when plutonium caught on fire in storage. And I hope it doesn't happen today. Anson Burlingame shares these sentiments, asserting that what's needed is not just an action plan, but immediate action. We can't just leave these tanks sitting here filled with nitric acid and plutonium for an indefinite period. They're potentially unstable. We need to get these liquids out of here and solidified, and any of the solid waste that are here, we need to have it treated so that it is truly stable and will not be in any continuing degraded condition, such that it could corrode, could, could, could produce potential hydrogen gas or other explosive mixtures, would not be a fire hazard. For all this resolve, Energy Department Manager Mark Silverman admits since Rocky Flats production line closed, there's been more paralysis than progress. In fact, he says at one site... The regulators kept asking questions. We did 17 volumes of study, paperwork over four years, and we didn't clean up a single problem at that site. Now he says that real cleanup is about to begin. A chilling realization has also sunk in. When we start going and doing the cleanup, it's going to be more hazardous and more dangerous to the workers, to the workers, first of all, than when we're in actual operation. How dangerous is this contaminated plant to visitors? Not very, we were told, because we were short-term visitors. But still, our bodies were frequently checked for exposure to radiation, just in case. The cleanup of Rocky Flats is viewed with skepticism and concern by many of those who work and live near the facility. When we return, in part two of Dave Marish's report, we'll hear from two workers who were exposed to the very worst toxic substances. This is ABC News Nightline. It was 1954 when Jim Kelly started his 37-year career at Rocky Flats. Well, I think people from the very beginning felt that the plant was a very special place. It maintained a very good reputation for a long time. And was always the place to work. Back in the 1950s and 60s, the hydrogen bomb was seen as the guardian of America's national security. But with so much at stake, Jim Kelly says, output soon erased human health as a priority. It was production, production, production. Safety, safety was a word. Uh, it wasn't really practiced. The job was to get the product out the door. And, uh, if you got it done safely, okay, and if you didn't, they'd turn their head. A lot of my good friends that I worked with in the 50s and the 60s are in real bad health. Among the people who worked for decades with Ray Geyer and Jim Kelly, there's a whole catalog of illnesses associated with exposures to radiation or toxic chemicals. They have beryliosis and asbestosis. Several of them have leukemia. Several of them have different forms of cancer. Uh, when I go to the retirement luncheons that they hold every uh, on an irregular basis, uh, I see them and it, it really tears you up. There wasn't a day I didn't work there that somebody wasn't contaminated. Karen Pitts represents a later generation. Her seven years at Rocky Flats began in 1984. 
Listen to her story of one of the many times, she says, she was contaminated. And we were working with some plutonium nitrate solution, and the liquid squoze up out of the tail of the cut, and it ran down my arm and down my leg, and I spent seven hours having my body deconned. Do you remember the feeling? Remember what ran through your mind as that stuff is spilling down the front of your body? Get it off. That's what you're thinking, get it off. So you lose your ability to be, um, you know, vanity. It's gone. I mean, that is gone. You don't care who sees your body. You just want to get it off and scrub me. I mean, that's just it. Karen Pitts is suing Rocky Flats. Almost every day, she says, she and her fellow workers would debate quitting there. But she says once you've worked at Rocky Flats, you're stuck there because your heightened medical risk requires insurance coverage. I guess after you've been exposed enough, you need those kind of benefits because people do get ill. And not only that, no one will take you. You tell them you work with Rocky Flats and they ask you, you work with radioactive material and they don't want you. You are a health risk. They see cancer written all over you. Are many Rocky Flats workers just pre-existing medical conditions waiting to be diagnosed? The true answer is nobody knows because almost nobody has tried to find out. The major exception, Greg Wilkinson, whose study of worker health was commissioned by the Energy Department in 1987. He found that exposures to uh, plutonium are suggestive of increased risks to uh, the uh, leukemias and lymphatic cancers and uh, also possibly to uh, some of the digestive cancers. But when Wilkinson's superiors at the Energy Department read his tentative conclusions, they told me to, uh, to withdraw the paper, not to let it get published. Wilkinson published anyway, but it was years before any follow-up research was done. Meanwhile, danger remains a constant at Rocky Flats, where a portion of the work floor in Building 771 is still closed months after an episode in which a worker draining plutonium-polluted liquids from tanks into these plastic bottles violated all the safety codes by mixing solutions. In doing so, he almost created a cocktail capable of going critical. Had a criticality occurred, the consequences could have been a sufficient neutron exposure to that operator and anyone within the immediate vicinity, it could have been a lethal exposure. In one sense, I'm sort of glad that it happened because it served as a wake-up call here to reinforce the need to rely on your procedures and not to rely on your process knowledge or your memory of what is there. Silverman and Burlingame say the swift action in closing down the fluid draining operation and disciplining the men involved in the accident are proof that things have changed for the better at Rocky Flats. But Ray Geyer insists things have hardly changed at all. You still have things that are happening that have to be taken care of. And they're still being taken care of the same way they were. They have to be because they don't have anything new to replace them with. While there's little disagreement on the dangers within the facility, there's a real debate on the threats posed by Rocky Flats to the environment and people living nearby. That, when we return. A stretch of asphalt behind me is known at the Rocky Flats plant as the 903 pad. But to Rocky Flats' as many critics, this is the launching pad. From here, contaminated groundwater leaked down the ridge towards the plain on the northern and western suburbs of Denver. As an individual worker, I protested, I protested that this, that was not right. Those drums were not going to last out on that on that pad. Well, it wasn't a pad then, it was out on the bare ground. The barrels, uh, in some cases, rusted and started leaking, and the, uh, the liquids that was in them, the cleaning fluids and stuff, uh, went into the ground, uh, carrying the plutonium with them. And so began one of the best-known migrations of toxic wastes away from Rocky Flats. It can be traced, says Dr. Gail Biggs, on a map of drainage patterns in the Rocky Flats area. Walnut Creek uh, drains down and uh, dumps into the Great Western Reservoir. And then uh, Women's Creek uh, comes down and uh, feeds the Stanley Lake Reservoir. Samples from the bottoms of both reservoirs show deposits of plutonium. The plutonium traveled through water and through the air, 
the winds are very strong that come through this corridor. And you can look right through the gap there on the plant where the two mountains come across. We see the Indian peaks behind us with the snow. Comes right down that through that canyon is one of the primary areas where the wind just really shoots down. Rocky Flats officials admit some plutonium dust was blown past the plant perimeter after a huge fire at Rocky Flats in 1957. An event an official of the Atomic Energy Commission told the Denver Post at the time caused, quote, no spread of radioactive contamination of any consequence. Plutonium caught fire in a dry box in room 180 in building 771 in the middle of the night. Before the fire was out, it had burned through all of the plant's filters, sending plutonium dust residues that had never been cleaned in four years up the stack. It's out in the atmosphere, and it's out in the environment. Since 1957, there have been other releases of plutonium and other toxics from Rocky Flats. We have just conducted some soil sampling along uh, both Dry Creek and out in the South Platte River Valley, and uh, those results uh, have suggested that the plutonium levels do not drop off as you go further away from the plant. As far as 40 miles from Rocky Flats, you find plutonium dust much, much closer you find people's homes. Well, oh, this development here is about how far as the crow flies from Rocky Flats? About two miles. Paula Ellison Gardine is an anti-Rocky Flats militant who's lived downwind of the plant for 30 years. She remembers when state guidelines discouraged home building within four miles of the plant's perimeter. Today, homes creep ever closer to Rocky Flats South Fence. That blue line area of concern has slowly disappeared as the developers have continued to lobby the county planning commissions. Matching the greed of the developers, says Ellison Gardine, has been the ignorance of their customers. Homeowners kept ignorant, she says, by state, federal, and Rocky Flats officials. An FBI raid in 1989, codenamed Operation Moonglow, turned up a lot of new information about allegedly polluting practices at Rocky Flats. Most of the info went directly to a specially formed grand jury. I had nightmares, you know, I couldn't sleep at night thinking about what I had heard for a whole week in that jury room. This woman was part of the grand jury, and so was this man. He led a unanimous rebellion two years ago against federal prosecutors. They, the grand jurors, told ABC News' as Catherine Cryer, had settled for a controversial plea bargain rather than criminally indict Rocky Flats officials from both Rockwell International and the Energy Department. At what point in time did the body decide they wanted to issue indictments? We, uh, <clears throat> questions like that, we'd like to answer and we could be doing 20 years for doing that. Justice Department threats of imprisonment silenced the grand jurors. Even a final investigative report the jurors wrote was censored by the judge. Reporter Ryan Ross broke that story. They thought that anybody who committed a crime should have been held accountable for it. They didn't care whether they worked in the federal government or the private sector or high up in the federal government they were. Uh, there were about 12 sections that were taken out of the report. Almost all of them had to do with the conclusions of the jury that the illegal conduct they found Rockwell had engaged in was continuing to be done under the successor contractor eg and &G. A congressional subcommittee investigated the case of the silenced grand jury in 1992, blasting the Justice Department not only for quashing individual criminal indictments. Most importantly, subcommittee chairman Howard Wolpe concluded, quote, the prosecutors bargained away their right to fully and accurately inform the public about the conditions, crimes, and activities at the Rocky Flats plant. The plea bargain not only protected Rockwell International and the Energy Department from grand jury revelations, Ray Geyer says it may shield them from liability for damages suffered by workers. It looks like, according to what I've read, it may be very difficult for my co-workers to get any kind of restitution for the damages done to their health because of the global immunity given to Rockwell in that settlement. That is scary. Today at Rocky Flats, they say they're focused not on the past, but on the future, and on a possibly unfundable compromise between two impossible solutions. When we're talking about cleaning up Rocky Flats, you have two extremes. At one end of the spectrum 
It's the do nothing, leave it alone, walk away from it. That's unacceptable. At the other end of the spectrum, you have clean it up the way it was in 1950 before the Atomic Energy Commission got here. That scenario could take 80 years, 90 years, 100 or more billions of dollars to do it. Mark Silverman's stopgap solution? Stabilize all the plutonium here and move the weapons grade materials inside a single building. He says he can do that for about a billion dollars by 1998. As for a more permanent solution, removing everything here to some remote location, that seems pretty remote itself right now. I'm Dave Marish for Nightline at Rocky Flats, Colorado. I'll be back in a moment. Many of us remember the scary schoolroom drills when we huddled under our desk. The danger of the mushroom cloud loomed as all too real. Now the danger comes to the workers who will have to clean up these plants and to taxpayers who will be saddled with an enormous bill. Even as we celebrate the end of the Cold War, we're forced to deal with the fact that its legacy will be with us for years to come. That's our report for tonight. I'm Koki Roberts in Washington for all of us here at ABC News. Good night. If you wish a video cassette version of Nightline, the cost is $14.98 plus $3.95 for shipping and handling. Please call 1-800-ABC-9420.